three, two, one. Sometimes, to build unique opportunities, you have to go to uncommon places in the world and in yourself. And in Africa, that means looking past the headlines and tapping into the raw talent that's all around you, and maybe learning a new language. Our guest today, Amadou Dafe, has done just that and more, founding Gabaya, a talent marketplace with thousands of technical freelancers that has raised over $3 million. We begin our discussion today with Amadou sharing how he started his career as a software architect in the United States. He then delves into how he built a pan-African community and consulting business with his first startup and how he eventually acquired the business in his latest venture, Gabaya. He then shares how he identifies untapped pools of talent in Ethiopia and Francophone Africa's population of 340 million people. We then talk about how to navigate regulatory hurdles in Africa's second most populous country and how he's ready to weather the headwinds and tailwinds that COVID-19 may bring. If you ever wanted to learn how to build moats into your business model or explore the Francophone and Horn of Africa technology ecosystems, this podcast is made for you. After the show, check out our show notes and learn more about Amadou and our other guests at VentureTheWorld.com. We are excited to welcome Amadou Dafe, founder of Gabaya Talent, to Venture the World today. He's one of the few African entrepreneurs that can say they've exited a company to themselves and he's dedicated to talent development across the continent. We also would like to thank Mobilaji Adeoye, who's of Consonant Investment Managers, who submitted a question for today's interview. So without further ado, we're glad that you're on and we welcome to Venture the World, Amadou. Thank you for having me, Chinedu. Mark. Yeah, thank you for being here. We'll start out with a basic question. Can you give us a little bit about your background from being a technology executive in the States to launching Gabaya Talent in Ethiopia? And I think in particular, that might be interesting to people listening to the podcast. You're Senegalese in the United States, and then you launch a company in Ethiopia. Tell us a bit about that. So from the executive part, I was trained as a software engineer in, in college. I had a bachelor's degree in computer science, later a master's degree in information systems. Started working for corporate America. Spent most of my time, my adult life in, in Philadelphia. I'm a Philly boy. I worked for different kinds of companies, anywhere from consultancy to ending up working for a law firm. And my last job was what you call an enterprise application architect, which means pretty much the entire software needs or application needs of the firm participate on it, deciding what uh, way we should go, help lead some teams and so on and so forth. It's during that moment that I've seen that there was a lot of opportunity that countries like Philippines and India, they were offering a lot of the outsourcing services. And being an African, I uh, said, well, what if we can do that? What if Africa can be an outsourcing hub as well? So I started investigating, started looking, is it possible? But my understanding of Africa revolved around three countries. I was actually born in Europe. I won't tell you what country, but I was born in Europe. And I spent some time in Senegal and later even in Niger. So I always consider myself someone who's more of an African rather than picking one country. People label me as Senegalese, I'll take it, but even my family side is a little bit more mixed in a sense. I only knew about that part of Africa. But then I started exploring the continent in a sense and started going to East Africa, went to South Africa, went to North Africa, and realizing the continent is much bigger than what I thought. And then the idea of building that outsourcing hub got big. Hence why later I created a company called Curtis for Africa with some friends of mine trying to take a piece of the big pie. And then at some point, the Curtis for Africa thing was a bit limiting because one, I was cheating, meaning I had one foot in the U.S., as you know, Chinedu, and one foot in Africa. I was traveling back and forth. But learning what it means to be an entrepreneur, it become an epiphany. I need to move. And I needed to pick a country. I was so detached from Senegal, the reality of French speaking and, and all these different things that, and the other fact that Senegal is a small country where the economy is so small, it's only 14 million people, although there's giants in Senegal. I realized, well, maybe I should start somewhere else where there's a little bit more momentum. And one of the countries at the time was Kenya. So I convinced another friend of mine who's as crazy as I am, who was an investor in Silicon Valley, Hiro Emmanuel, and convince him to move back to Africa to set up this company. At the time, we call it DAS, Developers as a Service, thinking like Uber model and stuff, but then we realized if we use the acronym, 
Germany may sue us because Das Auto and all those different things. So we said, well, let's use an authentic name. We went with Swahili first because a lot of people use Swahili words to build a company. At the time it was called Sokoni, which means marketplace. But then we're like, wait a minute, there's so many Soko out there, let's, let's change it, let's make it more authentic. We look into the Ethiopian side, we Google the name and come up with the name Gabea, which is the most prolific name in mean marketplace in Ethiopia. So we started the company between the two countries, Kenya and Ethiopia. And Kenya was because of the momentum I was looking for, but Ethiopia because of the untouched, little behind setup of the country that allows me to build anything very quickly, very significantly, and have an impact immediately. And the other side of the thing is a large population is 110 million people. But I had some engineers who were from Ethiopia before. So it's not like I just walk into the country and just started. I was traveling back and forth in the country, understanding how the mechanics works. But we were pretty much the company that came and led some of the initiatives in terms of techs in Ethiopia. So that's pretty much it for me. Just to double click on that, you started off with an investor. So, I mean, your angel round was about a million dollars. That's a big round for Africa, right? That's correct. So the investor was also a co-founder. So the way we figured how to build this company, we'll make it the three pillar model where here we wanted to invest in African startups. That's what he wanted to do. Uh, I wanted to invest in African talent through training and put them into a marketplace. So we figured it's the perfect match to come together where he brings the money and a little bit of money that I had I contributed about $100,000 or less. And then come together and say, Let's build it up to some point, but eventually here we will focus more into building, investing in companies, and I'll continue building this company called Gabea. But here we had the resources. So when I first came to him, the first check he wrote was $250,000. But when we moved to Ethiopia, it's a different country to invest in. As a matter of fact, the minimum investment for a startup at the time was $200,000. So we had to have $200,000 in the bank as operational money to prove to the government that we are here to stay. But then very quickly, we burned that cash because we were trying to have two entities at the same time, the one in Kenya and the one in Ethiopia, start burning cash in Kenya. Kenya is a very, very difficult market. People think it's easy. It's very difficult. So we burned so much cash, we almost ran out of money. So here we keep helping by putting more money into the business. So that's how we end up to, to the million dollars. But it's very significant. Not too many people are, are lucky like I was or had somebody to believe in them. And that much. I think I was even trying to raise money from you, Janine, right? Remember? <laughs> I think one of the things that will be definitely interesting for the audience to learn is you mentioned that in the early 90s and early 2000s, India outsourcing became the thing. And then around about 2010, there were many initiatives that brought tech talent outsourcing online from Fiverr and TopTal, they were both launched in that year. Even your initiative, Coders for Africa, was launched in 2010. So you were definitely at the forefront of the wave of bringing tech talent online. What do you think has changed over this past decade from the models that started in 2010 and then now your new model and the models like Gigster and Andela and Gabaya Talent? What has caused this new model to emerge of talent marketplaces online? For me, it's two things, specialty and geography. So all these companies you mentioned, except Andela, they're all in the US, and, or some of them are looking in Europe. Even Europe talent marketplace mentality is not fully spread out. The reason why, because of the labor laws, okay, it's different than the US law. So US, we always break the laws and, and the law will catch up to you later. Where in Europe, even Uber was banned in some of the European countries, right? So in Africa, it's like a blank sheet of paper. Nobody has created the market for talent. Mm. We're all trying to figure it out. Even Andela, if you look at it, they went down from 1,500 developers to some like 1,000, I believe, if that many. That's just like a drop in the water in the ocean, right? Because you have a billion people to fill needs for. So the good news is, for me specifically, what has changed is I'm able to create a market, mm -hmm. which is very significant in terms of specialty. Okay, we started out with software development because that's my background, but nothing stopped me now from saying, well, and you know this, you know, if you're trying to find a good lawyer or an accountant in Nigeria or any other African country, it's through referral or through a mess of disappointments and stuff like that. So somebody has to create that market of saying, let's create a talent marketplace for lawyers or accountants, for technical writers, uh, graphic designers, animators, what have you. So we have the tremendous opportunity here to create a new market. 
That's why it's an exciting for Africa. If I had to do a talent marketplace in the U.S., I would have wasted pretty much my time. There's thousands of them in the U.S. And what they do there, they specialize themselves. Like Fiverr does certain things, Toptal does for, for certain things, Upwork does the inventory model, having millions of developers or talent, and then you get to you know, fish around and see who you want to hire. So it, it's that thing. The marketplace talent in the U.S. is very mature. So it got to a point where it's becoming saturated, but there's so much demand for talent in the U.S. anyway, that even if it's saturated, everybody get a piece of the pie. In Africa, if you're a startup or a small business or even multinational are struggling to find local talent, which gives us a tremendous opportunity and advantage to you know, set what the market trends would be, but also position ourselves as a leader, at least in, in the continent. To follow up on that, when people would think of building a talent marketplace in Africa, they would think of two places first. One, Nigeria, because of the population, and two, South Africa, because maybe that's the country that people in the United States know. But what's interesting about you, you built Kabaya Talent in Ethiopia, and you actually raised a million dollars in order to do it. So for entrepreneurs thinking about building businesses in Africa, what did you see in East Africa that maybe other entrepreneurs or investors were missing? So Ethiopia is more of the raw talent I saw when I first went there. So let me give you a couple of numbers. About 400,000 people graduate in Ethiopia out of universities, specifically in STEM, science, technology, and engineering and stuff. 400,000. Wow. They have about 45 universities, okay, uh, of which I think one-third are tech schools. And this university is a little bit decentralized like Nigeria because they have states Okay, so every state has its own university structure and stuff like that. And I knew the country is pretty much behind other African countries for about 50 years because they've never been colonized. So they have to build the educational system from the way they know how. Whereby if you go to Kenya or Nigeria, they inherited the British educational system and they just added value on top of it, right, if any. In Ethiopia, nobody came and built these universities. They have to build it from scratch. So I'm like, this is the perfect place to shape the talent I need. And the other thing is the hunger in terms of success is a little bit different. An Ethiopian developer would take $5 an hour to prove himself rather than a Nigerian developer who wants to take $30 because they already thought the market dictates it, whether they're good or bad, right? It's just the way it is. So I figured I can hide, it was more of a strategy. I can hide and build the company quietly for the next four or five years without being disturbed because it's a high barrier to entry if you want to do business because of laws, because of taxes, because of internet. We get internet cut off every time. In the, and even culture, because the national language of Ethiopia is Amharic. It's not English, although young people learn English in school. So there's so many barriers. I position, I can build this company for another three, four years till I get strong. Then I can venture out to the rest of Africa. That's really the strategy behind it. Yeah, that's really smart. I think you and Tayo from Paga had a similar strategy in terms of leveraging the talent base in Ethiopia and leveraging the fact that it's hidden to the world. Do you think that's a strength of yours, being able to identify hidden areas of talent in the world or being able to understand where value exists? And then how is that lesson translated into other areas of your business? I tend to not follow what everybody is doing. When people were saying, oh, let's just go to Kenya and just take over the market. It's like, this is not gonna work. I've worked with Kenyan developers before. Half of them wanna be entrepreneurs. The retention rate is gonna be very hard to maintain. So right now, the other market I've identified is Francophone Africa, because nobody cares about Francophone Africa. When was the last time you heard a startup that's out there in the news that came from Francophone Africa? But the talent here is insane insane and they have an entire i think about 250 million people that speak french i believe around the world if not more and so what we did was i say hey let me tap into my senegalese origin hence why we expanded to senegal part of the last investment we did on the seed with orange and partick and stuff was to build out the talent pool in uh, francophone africa and the funny thing is these people that we find in senegal for example they do speak english it's not that they don't speak english they just live in a market where everybody speaks french so I get the best support for them. I get someone who I can place or train into a francophone concept, but who can also work for a English speaking person. So in the next market for me really to do the same thing in Ethiopia is francophone. I chose Senegal because it's the most stable country. At first I chose Cote d'Ivoire because of the market size. Again, they spend a little bit more money than Senegalese too. 
but because of the uncertainty with the elections there, it's like I have a better chance of succeeding in Senegal, although you're not king in your own home, right? But I have enough ties, I speak the language, I understand all I have to do is just make sure that I build the proper branding like I've done in Ethiopia, and you can connect the two dots. So Ethiopia eventually would be the Anglophone East Africa hub, uh, Senegal would be the Francophone West African hub. That brings us to a key point that you bring up, which is assessing risk as you expand across borders. You spoke about elections, and then you also spoke about the regulations in terms of the labor market. Where did you learn the lessons to assess those risks before entering the market? Boots on the ground. There's no other way of doing it. Africa is so different. The laws are so different country to country. You have to be on the ground. You have to experiment it. You have to go through it. Because when I hear entrepreneurs, I was like one of them. Remember, I used to say, I'll conquer entire Africa. I'll expand to this country, that country. It doesn't work that way. The biggest issue you're going to have at first would be culture and the politics of the country. So until you live there and understand how people think in that country, at least at a high level, and then understand what would prevent your business from growing, from a politics perspective, you, you won't be able to assess. You can do all the research, all the, the surveys and everything, you know, what everybody's talking about. Like everybody's saying Ethiopia is a country to invest in, right? There's so much data about that. But until you're there, <laughs> you actually go through the process of setting up a company, hiring people, firing people, people leaving you, or all different kinds of nuances, you won't really understand how you actually do it. So until I started diversifying now my executive team, I still need to spend time in that country. The good news in Senegal, I was able to hire a regional uh, director who understand the, the culture better than I do. You get me? Because from a business side, I know it from the culture of dealing with people, but from a business side, how do people do business in Senegal? What's the corruption? rate, I call it, because every country has a corruption structure, who makes the decision and all these different things. If they understand that, then I'm more comfortable to actually extend my business in that country. So it's very, very tricky, but you have to be on the ground, man. You have to. And it sounds from what you're saying that being on the ground, and this is true for all entrepreneurs and all startups, is a series of crises that you're facing. If you get on the ground and then you figure out, you know, it actually works this way, not the way that you thought it was working. So I want to ask you a two-part question about two of the biggest crises happening right now with the COVID-19, the coronavirus. Obviously, it's upending the world economy. How are you thinking about managing this crisis for your business? So past 30 days, we've run into a bunch of scenarios, assumptions, and mitigations, and different kinds of things to hold on to cash. So really, it's just holding on to as much cash we can for another 24 months. My concern is no longer COVID. It was COVID about a month ago because everybody's health, but it's about the recession that's coming afterwards. My second worry is when the U.S. goes to recession, Africa's recession will follow the year after because we don't take directions. To, like when you say we shut down, we're not. I mean, the car is not really shut down. Oh, I mean, people, really? yeah, yeah, people are, <laughs> I'm looking at my, in my love, I'm looking at cars <laughs> moving because, you know, people have to get out to eat. Yeah, yeah. You don't have... You know, hundred dollars in your bank account to go grocery shopping. You that day, if you don't get two dollars, you don't eat. That's interesting. Side note: on the news, as I'm watching it, it shows that the world is shut down. And certainly in New York City, when I walk outside, where normally there's two thousand people in the street, there's probably three people max. So I just assume all the other cities are doing a similar thing. So it's interesting to know those differences. Yeah, it's huge. So knowing all of that, we came up with a strategy, I can't discuss it here, but we came up with a way to stay cash positive for 24 months. Because I was going to raise again in 18 months, you know, after the seed we just closed. And to be honest, we were lucky. Maybe all the work we've done for four years or even before that gave us that luck because we just closed in February, $2 million seed, and then it hit. So we are going to be one of the lucky startups to survive this thing. You get my point. Whereby those people who raise a year before or were going to raise, if they run out of cash, that's it. Right now, the investor is holding on to their cash or yeah. seeing, well, who's going to die? Who's going to be last? So at least from that thing. I'm looking at now the upside. This upside will have so many opportunity in 12 months to 18 months from now. There's so many opportunities in terms of uh, generating revenue, creating new uh, innovative ideas. There's so many things that's going to happen because even the governments in Africa, this is a shock. They are thinking digital every day because these ministers 
are doing calls on Zoom, just like we're doing right now. You can ask Junedu, you cannot ask a minister whom you want something from <laughs> in Africa to do a Zoom call with you and to do a presentation. It doesn't work. So we are leapfrogging an experience. You know how there's all this thing about digital transformation, Africa, or bank, all these guys are talking. Africa never paid attention, right? The government comes, take some money and give it to this. And But now we are leapfrogging digital transformation at the moment. The opportunity is going to come out of that from telemedicine and healthcare and even logistics systems, uh, companies that do delivery and stuff like that. I use that every day because I can't get out of the apartment. All kinds of mechanisms are going to be a tremendous opportunity for companies like ours. If I position myself as one of the best talent companies that can provide the skill set for these governments, the businesses in Africa, forget the rest of the world, I think I can pretty much come out very strong and really build a company I'm looking to build. It seems like you already touched on the second part of that question, which was basically one of the great things about Asia, specifically China, is that they leapfrog the world in terms of communications technology and the communications revolution where many people didn't have phones and then all of a sudden they have smartphones. Exactly. So they skipped having to build all that infrastructure. And from what you were saying, Africa can do the same thing with digital transformation, going from not having any technology to actually having the most up-to-date digital technology and businesses around Africa. So the second part of that question was going to be, after COVID-19, we have the vaccine, great. Hopefully the recession is over. What's your outlook on African tech coming out of this crisis and what opportunities should we look out for? We ran a simulation that's going to grow 100% year over year in terms of innovation in tech because it's really educating us at a faster rate. Everybody, I mean, my mom, everybody's into, if you want to call it the matrix, we're all plugged into the matrix. The same information I'm getting, she's getting. The adoption rate of even ordering online that myth of ordering online for an African, it disappeared. Yeah. That's what they do. The only hope that I have is we really adopt telemedicine because one of the problems we have is the facilities, the number of doctors, especially in Ethiopia. There's one doctor for 20,000 people. Think about that because you can't train doctors fast enough. So one of the things we need to figure out and how do we take advantage, at least from a health thing, not just relying on donation and stuff that's been happening the past 50 years, but how can we champion a few things? And guys are doing very interesting things. They may not be as obvious out there because the news doesn't go up, but this landscape is going to change. People tell me, well, don't you think it's too fast? I'm like, well, this COVID thing is going to last another six months. It's going to last another six months. The way it's going right now, this, and in Africa, it's going to be longer because we don't follow rules here. People are still going to the mosque and doing things. So it's going to grow 100% year over year now. I can guarantee you that. The good news is the youth of Africa now can plug in. That's the moment. It reminds me of when Chinadu mentioned in the beginning that I worked at Alibaba. I actually lived in China, and it's reminded me just within about 10 years, let's just say 1996 to 2006, where in 96, very few people had phones. In 2006, every kid in China has a smartphone, not even like a regular phone, a smartphone. And so then businesses can move faster. What I'm hearing from you is we could be in the same transformation for African countries over the next 10 years, maybe the older people are still doing what they're used to doing, but the younger people, everything is digital for them. Their health records, their businesses, their insurance, everything they're doing is already digital, which is a pretty amazing transformation. One of the great things that you mentioned is that in two months, habits form and consumer behavior because of COVID-19 will present vastly new opportunities because in Africa, everyone will have to have adopted digital solutions, whereas before it was optional at best. We want to thank you for your time. We're really excited. You definitely are welcome back on Venture the World in the future. If you want to share with us when you do raise your next round, your Series A or B or later, you are definitely welcome back or any other time. If you want to make an announcement, we are very happy to have you on. It's rare to have such a talented entrepreneur that's been able to bridge two decades of 2010 to 2020 and to do that profitably in venture in Africa. It's really been impressive to watch and I'm glad to see that you've gotten to where you are and we look forward to where you're going to be going next. Very humbled for you guys to have me. I'll definitely be back. <laughs> definitely. Thank you. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Three, two, one. Hey, everyone. Thanks for listening. 
To find more episodes, visit VentureTheWorld.com. You can follow us on Twitter or Instagram at VTW underscore HQ. If you enjoyed today's episode, please leave us a review, which will help other listeners like you venture the world. Thanks.